welcome back to Oral Path. I'm Professor Richardson. This is going to be a pretty short video compared to my other lectures because we just have a few diseases to cover regarding non-neoplastic diseases of bone. We're going to talk about benign fibroosseous lesions first. And the first three of these conditions sound very similar, so pay attention to their distinctive features. Let's get started. Our first lesion in this category is a periapical cementoosseous dysplasia. In regard to this lecture, when we discuss dysplasia, we're referring to an abnormal and disordered production of cementum and bone, not neoplasia. Some people may refer to these lesions as cementomas, but that's really not the correct terminology. So remember, a cementoma is a neoplastic condition, so we should avoid using that term in reference to periapical cementoosseous dysplasia. We find these from time to time during routine radiographs because they're asymptomatic. So patients are generally not aware that it's present and they almost always occur in the mandibular anterior region. I've seen several of these in my career and it always, you know, at first you think, oh, there's some kind of trauma or abscess and that's not always the case. It's most commonly found in African American women over the age of 30. Now, it's easy to misdiagnose this as a periapical pathosis. Like I was saying, in its early stages, it presents uh, as a well-circumscribed radiolucent lesion at the apex. But over time, we would see the lesion become increasingly calcified. So here in the first image, you can see that it would e be easy to mistake this for a PAP. But in the second image, we see a much more advanced dysplasia. So this is where pulp testing can become very helpful. If the teeth are asymptomatic and vital, there's really no need for treatment. We would just monitor these lesions over time. Florid cementoosseous dysplasia is different from periapical cementoosseous dysplasia in that it usually involves multiple quadrants. It's most often seen in African-American women older than the age of 40, but the cause of this one is also unknown. Now, most of the time, this condition does not require treatment and it is asymptomatic. However, in an edentulous patient, these lesions can perforate the mucosa, which would result in an increased risk of osteomyelitis. So in that rare case, surgery would be indicated. Otherwise, we're just going to leave it alone. Focal cementoosseous dysplasia is similar to periapical and florid, but it does have some identifying features. Now, this one tends to be isolated, well delineated, and less than one and a half centimeters in size. As opposed to a periapical and a florid lesion, this one tends to occur more commonly in white females between the ages of 30 to 50. So we would more likely see this one in the posterior mandible. This is going to be asymptomatic and it does not require treatment. However, if we saw a lesion like this on a panoramic, it is important to note that we would refer this to the oral surgeon for biopsy. So anytime you see something on a pano or a radiograph that is abnormal, we want to make a recommendation for a referral on that. Fibrous dysplasia is a developmental disease where the bone is replaced with abnormal fibrous connective tissue as a result of a genetic mutation. So essentially, the bone is replaced with like a scar type tissue, and that causes the bones to weaken and become more vulnerable to fracture. The classic radiographic appearance of fibrous dysplasia is a diffuse radiopacity that is sometimes described as resembling ground glass, ground glass appearance. There are two types of fibrous dysplasia, monostotic and polystotic. Monostotic is the most common type, representing 85% of cases. Monostotic fibrous dysplasia is going to affect only a single bone, like in the mandible, versus 
polystotic, which will affect multiple bones. So here is your first submission question for this lecture. What is the difference between monostotic and polystotic fibrous dysplasia? Patients with fibrous dysplasia may be treated with bisphosphonate medications, which can help prevent bone loss. Remember those bisphosphonate medications are one of our red flags because patients who take that are at a higher risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw, particularly when it is used as an infusion therapy. Packett's disease of bone is a chronic metabolic bone disease. With this disease, there's going to be a disruption in the replacement of the old bone with new bone. This typically occurs in males over the age of 50, but the cause is unknown. So here is the only board alert in this lecture. Paget's disease is characterized by a radiographic cotton wool appearance. Paget's disease is characterized by a radiographic cotton wool appearance. What does cotton wool look like anyway? So for those of you who are not familiar, there you go. In the jaw, we would see hypercementosis, loss of the lamina dura, and obliteration of the PDL. Now, this is going to be a slow progressing disease. It's usually treated with medications that help break uh, reduce the breakdown of bone. And our last disease in this lecture is a central giant cell granuloma. We already learned about peripheral giant cell granuloma in a previous lecture. This one is going to be a localized condition of the jaw, and it is twice as common in females. So usually we would see this develop before the age of 30, and it's most commonly found in the mandibular anterior, but it can be seen in the maxillary anterior as well. The origin is unknown, but there are two types, aggressive and non-aggressive. With the non-aggressive type, it is usually small, asymptomatic, and it does not cause destruction. With the aggressive type, the lesions will be large and painful and destructive. So here is our second submission question. You guessed it. What is the difference between aggressive and non-aggressive central giant cell granuloma? Central giant cell granulomas are usually discovered during routine radiography. Now, another condition that's seen in routine radiography. So many of these things are asymptomatic, and it's a, a good example as to why we have to be looking for them other than just with our, our own two eyes. We need to see that radiographic image. Once they are discovered uh, with the giant cell granuloma, they are usually surgically removed, but they can recur. Okay, guys, I told you this is going to be the shortest lecture I think I have ever done. Um, in my last lecture in my series of Oral Path, I'll be discussing oral manifestations of systemic diseases. Um, and if you have any questions otherwise, please let me know. Don't forget to like my video, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our other videos. See you next time.